بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this new episode of Ask Zad coming to you live from Zad Studios Our first email for tonight is from Marcy Marcy says, do I have to wear the hijab in front of my male cousins who is about 11 years old? When do I have to wear the hijab and in what age of the children in front of male children? Now, we know that hijab is mandatory upon a Muslim woman in front of non-mahrams. What is the definition of non mahrams? Those whom she can get married to. So mahrams are like her son, her brother, her father, her uncle, paternal or maternal, her nephews, her father-in-law, her son-in-law, her step uh, um, uh, father and her step a uh, step uh, uh, son, etc. Now, having said that, what age would she ob be obliged to wear the hijab? So if I have a three-year-old uh, cousin of hers, male cousin, is she obliged to wear the hijab? The answer is definitely no. Three years is too young. Okay, what about if he is 15 years of age? So 15 year years of age, this means that he has reached the age of puberty and hence this is above the limit. By consensus, she has to wear the hijab. Then what is the limit? Scholars said that if the child is below the age of discernment, meaning that he's six years of age, seven years of age, does not pay attention to whether the woman is curvy or not whether her voice is soft and appealing or not. He doesn't look at her or at her body in a strange way. In this case, she's not obliged to wear the hijab. If he's like 10 years of age, not yet had reached the age of puberty, but you can tell by the way he looks and by the way he laughs at some jokes when the children talk about the body of a, of, of a woman his mother or whatever, and, and he laughs and, and, and makes a, a joke about it. By the way, he looks at other women. In this case, yes, she has to wear the hijab, not necessarily covering the full cover that she does when she's out at the street, but at least she has to cover her hair, her neck, her bosoms, uh, etc., and be decent in front of him. But once he approaches 13, 14, which is close to reaching the age of puberty, she has to wear the full hijab, and Allah knows best. Abu Yusuf from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Assalamu alaikum Shaykh. Allah yasallimak. Kif halak, Shaykh. Barakallah feek. Yes, Shaykh. Shaykh, I have, uh, in, fact, in fact, two questions. I think it's the same topic. Uh, two of my cousins, one is male, one is female. Recent, last year, female cousin, she celebrated her son's marriage, they, they did not invite us in the nikah ceremony. Of course, nikah usually held, I don't know, at home or in the, in the coast, something like that. Then they invited us, uh, sent the marriage reception, something like that. We went there. Then later on, we came to know this is from the girl's side. And her daughter-in-law's uh, threw a party, and we have to attend that one. It's okay. Then we were expecting that they might invite for the walima, which is, which is uh, necessary, I believe, as per Sharia. They didn't uh, invite. Never mind. It's okay. We, the second one is my male cousin, first cousin. He's going to celebrate uh, his daughter's wedding. They performed uh, nikah for her in, the, in their house. They did not invite us. And he said that we are going to, for, I mean, they said the final ceremony, that when the girl goes to the husband's house, uh, then uh, we will invite you in the party. So I was, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm curious whether should we attend 
the the party they are going to throw on behalf of their girls so this is not I believe i believe it's not necessary the party i what, told him is what is your concern abu yusuf yani are you concerned that the women's family will be paying for it yeah they are paying 100% they are spending so many hundreds of thousands okay. they have already spent before for one daughter maybe half more than half a million at 10 1 million rupees pakistanis so okay. then now this is the second one is going to happen in jeddah so they are going to celebrate uh, this one party um, i said this is haram i said uh, this is ghair sunnah what can we do we have to we are obliged this thing that thing people will make more this thing that thing so i am thinking shall i attend if they invite or not shall okay. i reject i will answer you inshallah yeah barakallahu feek okay abu yusuf's concern from saudi arabia and this is a very valid concern because unfortunately in the subcontinent in pakistan in india and in bangladesh and elsewhere they put great deal of emphasis on this haram practice and that is that when a man proposes there is a lot of financial burden on the girl's family to the extent that they go out of the straight path of islam and the boy's family demand from the girl's family a dowry which the hindus practice and the muslims unfortunately who are muslim by name still practice it and they say that this is okay no it's not okay at all it is the responsibility of the man to take care of all financial uh, um, commitments so he's the one who pays for the dowry he's the one who throws the meal of nikah which is usually the sunnah is to happen after they consummate the marriage but if it happens before or on the night of there's no problem inshallah he's the one who's responsible for providing for their marital home furnishing uh, uh, put the furnishing furniture in it and all the other expenses this is his responsibility in islam the father of the girl is not obliged to pay a single dime it's not his responsibility in islam now having said that there are cultural things so for example if someone proposes to my daughter and they come to write the contract we have here in in, in jeddah saudi arabia we have two things we have what is known as milka and we have the wedding night milka is the marriage contract so at first they come and they propose and the boy sees the girl they like each other the father comes officially proposes to me and i accept he asks me in between each other are there any conditions and we acknowledge whether there is or there isn't khalas done okay next week you guys come officially for the marriage ceremony so they come and they write the contract of marriage everything is set now the tradition is that we the family of the bride we throw an invitation that it is small and this is why your cousin when they made the nikah the marriage contract they didn't invite you because usually this is small very limited my siblings maybe my sons in law and he brings his siblings and his father it's at uncles maybe so it's like 20 30 people and it's all only for men usually and then we agree on the night of the wedding night which is probably a month two three depending so this one is a big night now usually the the the, the bride the, the groom there is the boy is the one who takes care of it sometimes he comes to me and said uncle uh, uh, here are like 20 cards invitation for you so i can invite 20 of my friends especially if it's in a hotel or in a, a big place now my family is big so i say okay tell you what i will take uh, uh, um, half of the cost on me so that i can bring 150 of my friends and le- relatives and make it a big night and the boy says okay i'm fair i'm fine with that maybe the boy says listen i can't afford a wedding 
So I'm not throwing a wedding altogether. Three months from now, I'll come and collect my wife, and maybe we'll make a, a walima, which is for 10, 20 people, a very small one, and alhamdulillah. A lot of the families said, no, my, my daughter wants to uh, wear her wedding dress, and she wants to be happy. This is one night in a lifetime. So don't worry, I'll take care of it. Now, this is not obligatory upon me, but I'm offering because I want it. So in a nutshell, Abu Yusuf, don't hold a grudge against your cousins. It is their right to invite you for one party and not for the other party, depending on their financing. Secondly, there's no problem in accepting the invitation for both. This is totally permissible, inshallah. Muhammad from Jordan, apologies for the delay. Yes. Uh, hi, how are you, sir? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, thank you for uh, this program, uh, very useful and... Uh, yes, Akhi, what can I do for you? Uh, I want to ask uh, Sheikh about... Um, uh, having a good manner isn't just a plus factor when socializing, but... Um, uh, I, speak, all... I, I speak only English, yeah, Muhammad. Speak slowly, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for this program. Okay. Very much. Uh, I want to ask about a um, uh, small thing. Having a good manner uh, isn't, just a plus, isn't just a plus factor when socializing, but continue all life, all our life. How can we improve our manners, improve our um, deal okay. with people? Okay. Yeah. Any more That's questions, nice. uh, Muhammad? Thank you very much. Barakallah. Muhammad from Jordan asks a very important uh, a question. And unfortunately, this is a Q&A program. Otherwise, I would have spent and taken the rest of the program to talk about this important issue. Having good manners, or what we know in Arabic as al-akhlaq. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, that a man on the day of judgment would reach the highest elevation of Jannah that only those who are martyred in the cause of Allah and those who pray all night long and fast all day long would reach by having good manners. Subhanallah. And the Prophet والسلام, said that the closest to me on the day of judgment in paradise from among you are those who have good manners. Now, what do we define by when we say good manners? Is it when I enter a room and a, a lady wants to come in, I open the door and says, ladies first, and she's not a mahram? <laughs> this is not good manners because she's not a mahram. You should not gaze and, and look and talk and do all of these things, it's un-Islamic. You go on your way, she goes her way. Is it good manners to hold the fork with the left and the knife with the right and cut the meat and eat with your left? This is un-Islamic, haram. What do we mean by good manners? Good manners is to be forgiving, to be kind, to be generous, to be courageous to be polite, not to use abusive uh, 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 words, not to slander people, to observe what comes out of your mouth, to learn how to smile when you uh, meet people, of course, from the same gender, not from the opposite gender, uh, and so on. So good manners is a lot of things that all fall under the umbrella of Islam. Now, the one million euro question or shall I say the one million Kuwaiti dinar question is, how can we attain this beautiful characteristic throughout our lives? Because we noticed that when we, are, when we were young, we were, we were a bit rude, uh, impolite, disrespectful. And then at a certain time of our lives, we started learning dip diplomacy, being polite, 
um, being kind. It, it, it gives us a lot of credit. But when, when we grow old and our hair turns white, we come or, or we become grumpy. Most grandparents are a bit grumpy. They're unable to tolerate the children when they play. And they start to shout and scream and become angry. And, and so how can we attain this through our lives till we die? Muhammad, this is a beautiful question. And if you spend your life working on it, wallahi, it's not a waste. The first thing is that you look into your beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's biography. Read his seerah. Read the books of Ash-Shama'il for a Tirmidhi, uh, uh, for a tirmidhi or uh, uh, even a Suyut would do any uh, uh, Shama'il that is authentic and try to impersonate him sallallahu alayhi wasallam in everything that he used to do. How he treated them. A beautiful book by uh, uh, Sheikh al-Munajjid. And this book shows you how the Prophet والسلام, used to treat his wives, his children, his servants, the non-Muslims, the newly reverted Muslims, his companions, his neighbors, those who were openly sinners, those who were secretly sinners, all types of people around you. If we manage to uh, uh, adapt this in our lives, and implement it, then you will be among those who will be close to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. May Allah Azza wa Jal make me and you among them, uh, and Allah knows best. AGI says, I store sacks of beans with the intention of selling during raining season in order to help me planning the season. Is that hoarding, which is prohibited according to Islam, uh, in Islam? What is hoarding? There is an authentic hadith where the Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, la yahtakiru illa khati. No one hoards except sinners. So what is hoarding? It's a long topic. And scholars differed whether it is only in grain, things that people need to eat, or can it be also in clothes, in cars, in uh, uh, raw materials, etc. And the most authentic opinion, and Allah knows best, is that hoarding, and that is keeping something from the public until they are in dire need of it, and cannot find it except with you, and you raise and control the prices accordingly, this is sinful. Because now you are controlling other people's lives. Example, I buy rice and I hoard it and I store it in my warehouses, knowing that in a particular time, people will run out of rice. So when this time comes, a bag of rice that costs a euro, I sell it for five euros. The problem is that people don't have any other alternative. So I'm, it is not an issue of demand and supply because now I'm con in control and people have no choice but to pay me whatever I ask them and this is hoarding that is sinful. If there are five or 10 other agencies or dealers who have the same what I sell, then there's no hoarding. If they don't want to buy it for five, they can go to Abdullah and he sells it for three. They can go for Ahmed and he sells it for two. So this is demand and supply. There's no problem in that. So I hope this answers your question, AGI. Amatullah says, we have three sisters. We sleep together, but I heard that we should sleep separate. We do not have too much space as well. Is the hadith regarding this authentic? The hadith is definitely authentic. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, instruct your children to pray when they're seven and spank them or beat them to pray when they're 10. And 
separate them in bed. So the instruction of separating them in bed includes boys and boys, girls and girls, boys and girls. However, when the place is tight and there is no other place to sleep except this bed and the sisters want to sleep together or the brothers want to sleep together, then there is no problem, inshallah, providing that they are fully covered. Secondly, that they each have her or his own blanket or uh, uh, um, covering. So they do not use the same blanket to cover themselves with, but each one has a separate blanket and this or a bed sheet. This is inshallah permissible and Allah knows best. Zain says, is it permissible to make wudu while nude taking a ghusl bath? Are you also allowed to make wudu while your aura is not completely covered? Example, with towel uh, shorter than the knee length, can you change your clothes while in the state of wudu? And does it nullify if your body parts, uh, example, private parts is exposed? All what you have said, Zain, does not affect your wudu. It is not part of the conditions for the validity of wudu to be covered. So if a person takes off his clothes, totally nude, he's in the, in the toilet on his own and performs wudu, there's no problem with that. If a person is in wudu and he already has performed wudu and then he decides to change his clothes and wear new ones, no problem. This doesn't affect your wudu because the things that nullify wudu are known and specified and none of them is exposing your aura. It's not included in the five things that nullify your wudu and Allah Azza wa knows best. We have a short break, stay tuned and inshallah we'll be right back. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reminded us through his guidance and example that Islam is complete submission to the will of Allah. For one who submits a mere declaration or display of belief will not be taken for success, but his or her heart and soul will certainly be put to test. Allah tested the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam severely in order that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam becomes an example for his companions to follow. Similarly, he tests the believer to see whether he lives a righteous life in accordance with the instructions and commands set by Allah or lives according to what his desires dictate. Whether the faith he displays is firmly rooted in his heart, or is it merely on the surface, he will be tested to see whether he will continue to have faith and love of Allah when in a calamity, as he does when in comfort, whether he will continue to remember and worship him if given bounties, and comforts of life as he does when he lives a modest life, Allah will undoubtedly test him to see if his faith, trust and love of him is unconditional or is it conditioned upon good health and a comfortable life free from stress and anxiety. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed us through his own example that for a righteous Muslim, this life is a testing ground where he will continue to be tested until he meets Allah. For him, tests will be conducted on earth while he lives and not after he dies. He knows that as soon as death arrives and he steps into the next world, his tests are over. There, he only receives the result of his tests and enjoys the fruits of the deeds that he committed during a short span of time called life.
محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله and welcome back Salisha Salisha says I have a necklace with Allah's name on it can I wear it now I'm presuming that Salisha is a name of a female because if the person asking this question is a male, this is totally prohibited and haram. Men must not wear necklaces, none whatsoever. So what is the ruling on women wearing a necklace with Allah's name on it? Some scholars say that this is not permissible. If a person is wearing it with the intention to show an identity, because this is imitating the Christians, for example, who wear a cross. So why are you wearing a necklace with the name of Allah? And she says that this is beautiful. No, this is disrespectful for the name of Allah. Allah's name is not used, must not be used for decoration purposes, like we find in some masjids or in some homes, especially if it is associated with the name of Muhammad, Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad. You have Allah, Muhammad. Now, this is wrong. And it is often disrespectful because without noticing, you may go to the toilet, you may go to inappropriate places where it is not befitting with, for the name of Allah to be present there. Now, having said that, scholars also stated that wearing a ring with something that may include the name of Allah is permissible providing that they looked at the hadiths that some of the companions or a lot of the companions may have uh, uh, worn some rings of this nature with names of Allah, maybe, or something that is related to it, engraved on it. But scholars say that if someone knows for sure that this is not for, one, showing off, two, that he would not use it to wash himself when relieving himself or enter haram uh, or places that he's not allowed to enter it with, then inshallah, this is permissible for the rings and Allah knows best. Uh, um Maryam from Jordan. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamualaikum. Uh, doctor, can I ask you for uh, about al istikhara prior? Yes. And uh, how can I make it? And uh, what are uh, the conditions for uh, al istikhara prior? Okay, I will and answer. Thank you for the, this program. Barakallah feekum. Zakumullah khair. Um, Maryam's question is about istikhara. How can we make istikhara? If you read the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, and it's a single hadith, and if you read it, you will benefit and learn from it and know exactly what is to be done and what is not to be done. So the Prophet says, والسلام, whenever one attempts to do something, this means, meaning that it is not to make a choice between two things. I have two pens, this one and this one. So this black and this is blue. Which one to buy? I wouldn't pray istikhara so that Allah would direct me and guide me to which one to buy. This is not how istikhara works. A man has two proposals. One who lives in uh, a zarqa and the other one lives in Amman. So he's hesitant which one to get married to. Then he prays istikhara. No, this is, this is not the way it works then how does it work? The Prophet says, when someone attempts to do something, meaning that I made up my mind to get married to the one who lives in a zarqa. Now I've made up my mind. The conditions, the qualifications, the uh, 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 description fits what I want. I made up my mind, now I pray istikhara. Then what is the use of istikhara? Huh? The istikhara is asking Allah Azza wa Jal to choose whether this marriage is good for me or not, whether buying that car is good for me or not, whether applying for this job, which I have already uh, 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 
got my mind made up on picking it. Is it good for me or not? So I say the dua after I pray. So the Prophet says, You have to pray two rak'ahs other than the farida. So Sunnah al-Fajr does the job, it does the job. Um, Tahiyyat al-Masjid does the job, no problem. Duha prayer, go for it. So I pray two rak'ahs. After I give salam, according to the most authentic opinion of scholars, I ask Allah, do I raise my hands or not? It's not mentioned in the hadith. So say it without raising your hands. And what do I say? You say, oh Allah, Allahumma inni astakhiruka bi'ilmik, wa astakdiruka bi'qudratik, wa as'aluka min fadlika al-azim, fa innaka taqdiru wa la aqdiru wa ta'lamu wa la a'lamu innaka anta allamu al-ghuyub. You say these words, I'm not at liberty to translate them. You can find them in the fortress of the Muslim. Uh, um Maryam, I, I'm presuming you're an Arab, so inshallah you know. So you say this, asking Allah, if marrying that woman, buying that car, applying for that job is good for me and for my welfare in this dunya and in the akhirah, then make it happen and make it easy for me to get it and attain it. But if it is not good for me in this dunya or in the akhirah, and it's not good for my affairs, then take it away from me and give me something better than it in its place and make me satisfied with that. So you're asking Allah to make me satisfied with the choice. Sheikh, I almost died just to get that car. I love that car. I prayed istikhara, I could not buy it. Akhi, this is from Allah. But if your istikhara was original, if you asked Allah Azza wa Jal wholeheartedly, you would have felt comfortable. So when you pray istikhara and make the dua and you apply and you propose and you move on, go ahead and progress in whatever you wanted to do and it doesn't materialize, you feel content. You never have regrets. You would never come after 10 years and you say, had I bought that car 10 years ago, life would have been different. Had I married that woman, I would have done this and that. No, because you prayed istikhara, you gave your control to Allah Azza wa to choose for you. And when Allah did that, you accepted it and were content with it. Um, about the conditions, I don't know what you meant by that, but some people say, okay, is it part of istikhara? Now I proposed to the woman in a zarqa and I saw a dream. And in the dream, there were a lot of snakes with blue eyes. So that, is this related? So should I cancel it? No, akhi, dreams have no impact on istikhara. A lot of the girls call and say, a man proposed, I prayed istikhara, and then he canceled the proposal. And when we asked the family why, he said that his mother saw a nightmare related to the marriage and they canceled it. This is not related to istikhara, this is related to shaitan. Satan himself personally came and gave your mother this dream so that he would cancel a righteous and, 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 and good and pious wedding like that. So istikhara has nothing to do with dreams. It doesn't have anything to do with a sign. So I looked at the sky and I saw like a window opening. No, there's nothing like this. This is all nonsense. It is not, it does, has nothing to do with, I went out of my home and then there was a car crash or there was a black uh, cat dead on uh, the doorway or what. All of this is nonsense. So what is the khara? Make up your mind to choose something. Pray to rak'ahs that are not related to fard. Make the dua and move on. Continue. Proceed with it. And inshallah, if there's good in it, Allah will make it happen. Ma Mahin or Mahin says, now with non-surgical intervention, that is with silicon or such liquid insertion, nose structure can be improved as well as the other facial features 
also can be beautified. There are not, or these are not permanent, but for a short duration. Are these non-surgical interventions halal or haram? What about other cosmetic surgeries? This is something that is recent, and it is from um, uh, only few t tens of years, maximum maybe 100 years uh, old, much less. So when you want to study something as such, you have to go back to the Quran and Sunnah to see the roots of it. In chapter 4, Surah An-Nisa, Allah tells us that Satan took a pledge upon himself to make the humans change the creation of Allah. This is number one. In the authentic hadith, which is agreed upon, Hadith Ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, the Prophet ﷺ cursed those, a number of women, among them who use tattoos, who make hair extensions, and those who uh, file their teeth to separate the front teeth to give an impression that they are younger. The Prophet said in the description to change the creation of Allah. So we get a glimpse of what is haram. But at the same time, there was a companion who during battle got his nose chopped off. So the Prophet ordered him والسلام, to take an external nose made of silver and silver, as we know, when it comes in contact with moist and, and liquids, it, it changes color and gives a smell. So the man complained to the Prophet والسلام, and the Prophet والسلام, ordered him to take a nose of gold. So when we look at these in a nutshell, there are many other evidences, but we don't want to spend so much time explaining to you. In a, net, in a nutshell, Maheen, scholars said that if the change in Allah's creation is for the sake of beautification, mere beautification, this is totally prohibited and a major sin. But if it is to remove a defect, to remove something that is wrong, a person born with a cut uh, a lip, children have this illness or disease, I don't know what they call it, and when they grow up, it doesn't look good. A person who has a sixth finger, a person who has uh, um, in his body burns and scars that resulted due, an act, due to an accident, and he's mutilated. In this case, beautification uh, or um, plastic surgery, or cosmetic surgeries are permitted because they are restoring what is normal and original. But if it is something for beautification, a woman who would like to enlarge her buttocks so that it would look more sexy, or a man who would uh, like to do something in his body that is not natural. He likes to change the way his nose looks or his cheekbones or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with him. And this is not permissible. Coming back to the question, what's the ruling on fillers? Surgical interventions that uh, uh, where silicon is used or liquid insertion. Scholars say that, yes, if there is something bad in your nose, it's crooked, it's uh, out of balance, it looks not normal, and you use these fillings, then this is permissible. There's nothing wrong in that. A woman who, after seven or eight pregnancies, had her uh, breasts uh, um, sagging and dangling, and her husband doesn't like this, can she uh, have surgical intervention to correct it as it was before, totally permissible and legit, insha'Allah, and Allah knows best. Uh, Muhammad or Mahmoud from Syria. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I have one question. Yes. Uh, can we do the uh, Quran without hijab? Can you? 
a woman read Quran without hijab. Okay. okay. I will answer your questions. Ayyakum Allah. Um, Mahmoud's question from Syria is a good question because a lot of women from the subcontinent especially ask about this. They have this trend that if you're sitting home with your child or with your husband in your normal clothes and the adhan is called, they immediately put their hijab on. And the, eld, the, the old women in the society and community say, you cannot read the Quran without proper hijab. You must not enter the, the toilet without wearing the hijab. You mu well, who said this? Whoever mentioned this in the Quran or in the Sunnah, this is totally baseless and has no proof in it. When you want to recite the Quran, no one tells you to wear your three-piece suit and sit uh, uh, in a spe specific uh, uh, posture to recite the Quran. You can recite the Quran in any clothes you're wearing. You can recite the Quran even lying down. Our Prophet ﷺ used to recite the Quran lying down with his head in Mother Aisha's lap. So people who make other people's life difficult are not doing Islam a good job. And you as a Muslim, you are ordered to question such rulings. Where did you bring it from? Where is it in the Quran? Where is it in the Sunnah? I said, yeah, yeah, there is a scholar in uh, uh, Madrashkar who said this. Who is he? We have the four schools of thought. We have the companions. We have the tabi'een, tabi'it, tabi'een. Where is this ever mentioned? I don't know. So to answer your question, Brother Mahmoud, there is no evidence to support it, and she can recite it where, however uh, she's dressed. Uh, Wajdi from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu wa alaikum, Sheikh. How are you, brother? Barakallah feek, Sheikh Wajdi. Hayakallah. I have a question, Sheikh, in regards to uh, zakah. I, I, um, it seems to be common that people uh, wait till the month of Ramadan uh, to pay off their zakah, uh, even, even if it may be due in another month. Okay. Um, is this valid? And also, if uh, someone's zakah is due, uh, how how much time like of, of a delay? How much of a delay is allowed? Let's say they couldn't find the right recipient uh, for the for the zakah, and so it took them like a couple of weeks to find the right people. Is that allowed, okay. or is it considered to have delayed the zakah way beyond the acceptable time? Okay. Any more questions, Sheikh Wajdi? Barakallah fiqh, no, that's it. Barakallah fiqh, Okay, uh, brother Wajdi. Um, had two questions. First question is a very valid question. A lot of the Muslims fall into this mistake. They think that, okay, let's hit two birds with one stone. Zakat is mandatory upon me. And when is a better time to give zakat out other than Ramadan? So they delay their zakat until Ramadan. And some of them do it religiously, thinking that, Yes, this is part of Islam. Zakat can't be paid except in Ramadan. This is totally bogus. What do you mean? Akhi, never the Prophet ﷺ instructed us to give zakat in Ramadan. Nor the companions, nor the, uh, the followers of the companions. First of all. Second of all, zakat is mandated once a lunar year passes. So if I started saving, or I got 100,000 Kuwaiti dinars, Allah Kareem, uh, this month, which is Rajab, uh, which is Jamad al-Ula, for example, the fifth month of the Hijri calendar. After one year, the same month, I have to give zakat 2.5%. This is the condition, one, to reach the threshold, and tablug al-nisab, two, that a full lunar year, Yaduru alayha al-hawl is complete. Now to delay it to the month of Ramadan, it is totally prohibited because it is prescribed at a specific time that you have to pay. It's like someone saying, Akhi, Maghrib prayer is like about 6.30. Uh, 
but because I know that the best and preferred time for Allah is the last third of the night, which is approximately at 2.30 a.m., so I'm going to delay my maghrib and pray it then. I say it's not accepted. Don't pray it because Allah will not accept it from you. You are innovating in the deen. You're, you're making up things that the Prophet never instructed us to do, alayhi So this is wrong. And it's a misconception. Not only that, Akhi, you are harming the poor. So, astaghfirullah, how would I be harming the poor when I'm giving them money in Ramadan? When every Muslim gives his zakat in Ramadan to the poor, what about the rest of the year, which is 11 months, and the poor are needy, and they're waiting for someone to give them a helping hand, and he said, no, only in Ramadan. While if I give my zakat in Muharram, and you give it in Safar, and he gives it in Rabi'ah, and he gives it in Rajab, and he gives it in Shawwal, then the poor would be able to accommodate their needs throughout the year, not on a specific month. Now, Brother Wajdi says, what about delaying it so that a particular participant is available? Well, the scenario, as scholars say, is one of two. Either the participant or the recipient of the zakat is soon to come. So it's like a week, 10 days, maybe a little bit, give or take, a few days, a couple of days. There's no problem in delaying it with this intention. But if the guy is, for example, in um, uh, Pakistan, and he's coming after four months. You cannot delay it this far or this much. He said, Sheikh, but he's my cousin and, I, and he's really poor and needy. I'm only going there after four months to give him the zakat. So can I keep it with me? Yes, you can, providing you give him a call today when the zakat is due. And tell him, uh, uh, my zakat is due today or I have... 2,000 riyals uh, um, for you with me. So do you authorize me to keep it to you until I come after four months? If he says, yes, no problem, keep it with you, please. In this case, the zakat has been given to the recipient and you are now a wakil, an agent for him. You have received it and kept it for safekeeping until you go and send it to him and this is permissible. But to delay it for more than a week, 10 days, give or, so, uh, give or take a couple of days more, this is, as the scholars say, is not legitimate. One more point, and this is a bonus, and it's an extra thing, uh, is that delaying it is not permissible, but paying it before its time is permissible. How is that? My zakat is always on the eighth month of the year which is Sha'ban. And now we are in the fifth month, which is Jamad, Al-Ula. And all of a sudden, I see someone who is in desperate need of zakat. He is deserving to take zakat. So I said to myself, I can't wait another three months. The guy is in dire need. So what do I do? I can give him the zakat of three months later, now. So if for example, I estimate that my zakat would be 10,000 riyals. So I give him the 10,000 riyals for his operation, for his rent, for uh, paying off his debt, whatever he needs it for. And when Shaban comes, the eighth month of the year, I recalculate my zakat and see how much am I obliged to give zakat. If it is 12,000, so the balance is 2,000. I gave him 10. I have 2,000 now to give for uh, uh, the deserving people. No problem. If it is less, if my real zakat is 8,000 or 9,000. So the 9,000 of zakat has been given. And the 1,000 extra is a charity. And it cannot, uh, there's no problem, inshallah, in doing that. And the hadith of, Ibn, uh, of Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, alayhi where the Prophet himself said that Al-Abbas gave me his zakat for two years in advance, which means that paying it in advance is permissible and Allah knows best. Aisha says, can my brother through breastfeeding be my wali? 
if my father dies and if I don't have any blood brothers, and does he inherit my parents? First of all, the tahrim or the prohibition of breastfeeding or suckling is only in marriage and nothing else. So if my wife suckles a child and the child grows and everybody knows that he is my son out of suckling or breastfeeding, when I die, he doesn't inherit. And he cannot be a guardian to my daughters because he's, an, he's not a blood brother. He's not a real brother. So for you, uh, Aisha, yes, the brother through breastfeeding cannot be a guardian for you. And he does not inherit your parents or you. The prophets told us والسلام, that the Muslim ruler or the judge would take the place of a guardian for a woman who does not have a guardian. So in your case, if your parents are dead, you have no siblings, then it is your paternal uncles. They are your guardians. If you have no paternal uncles, then your paternal cousins. They are your guardians because they carry your name. If you have none and you're cut from a tree, as we say in Arabic, in this case, you uh, go to the Muslim court or to the Islamic court. Uh, center, the authorized uh, Islamic center, and the imam would become your guardian, and Allah Azza wa knows best. Um, Imran says, can we pray funeral prayer for a person who committed suicide, and can we pray for his maghfirah, for his forgiveness, and give charity on his behalf? The answer in a nutshell is, yes, all Muslims can pray funeral prayer and ask Allah for forgiveness, for someone who committed suicide. But the only exception is for the imam, meaning that the Muslim ruler or the Muslim judge who uh, deputizes him, they are not allowed to lead the prayer. And this is what the Prophet did, والسلام, he did not lead the prayer over someone who committed suicide, but he ordered everyone else to do. So why didn't he do that? So that people would know how grave this sin is to the extent that people would know and be notified that this person has committed suicide, but everyone else can pray it and ask Allah for forgiveness and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. This is all the time we have until we meet same time next week. I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.